Sudan descending into violence, with deadly gun battles exploding on the streets of the capital Khartoum. Military jets taking to the skies, the fighting causing widespread destruction. Stunning scenes coming out of Sudan as the violence in that country continues, and civilians trapped in the middle of the fighting desperately try to escape. And over the past few weeks, countries around the world, including Canada, have been working to rescue their foreign nationals. Welcome to About That. I'm Lauren Burden for Andrew Chang. Today, we want to delve into the dangerous journey that many have had to take to get out of Sudan and what lies ahead for those who are still trying to get out. When everything kind of flipped 180 degrees, it was literally overnight that we just kind of thrown into chaos. I think yesterday was probably the first day that I slept without the sound of bombs uh, ringing in my ear. Um, I must say that we are quite traumatized. These stories from Sudanese Canadians who've escaped the violence in Sudan are distressing and terrifying. In the past couple of weeks, the country has descended into conflict. The army and a paramilitary group have been fighting for power, and the capital city, Khartoum, has been under relentless bombardment. According to Canada's defense minister, roughly 400 Canadians have been flown out with the help of the Canadian military. Up until now, foreign nationals trying to get out of Khartoum have had to make a dangerous journey through a war zone, through roadblocks and bombardments to get to a base where a flight might be waiting for them. It's harrowing and it's about to get a lot harder. That's because for the 230 Canadians still stuck in Sudan, there are no more scheduled flights to get them out of the country and into safety. So now, the government is looking at other options, like evacuating the remaining foreign nationals by sea from Port Sudan. But the roads to get to Port Sudan, which is nearly 850 kilometers away, are full of danger. Many people have escaped Khartoum overland, but the UN says there are 22 roadblocks on the way to Port Sudan, and there are reports both sides are stealing vehicles and fuel. Yesterday, Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister, Melanie Jolie, confirmed that the Canadian Armed Forces are in fact in Port Sudan. Canadians could consider going to Port Sudan. We have a team right now of armed forces along with key diplomats that are there to make sure to understand a bit more the situation on Just the ground. Just so clear, we have Canadian soldiers in Port Sudan right now? We have armed forces in Port Sudan as we speak. But many of those Canadian citizens will have to figure out how to actually get there on their own. The team made up of Canadian soldiers and diplomats is in the port city awaiting any Canadian citizens who manage to reach it. It is, of course, a 30-hour journey from the capital city, Khartoum, amidst growing violence. The situation is chaotic, to say the least, and Canada hasn't acted as quickly as other countries like the UK, Germany, France, and the US. Our allies were much quicker on the draws. The Germans evacuated uh, some uh, 12, some uh, 520 people uh, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. The Brits started their evacuation on Thursday, and so it shows that you know when you underinvest in national defense, it means that you don't have the people, you don't have the capacities, and you don't have the assets in the place and time when you need the most. I just think a little bit more organization. Um, would have been helpful, especially seeing as if another country just as capable as mine uh, managed to do it within the first few days of the conflict. Um, yet I was asked to wait within the last day of the ceasefire, and even then it was not even guaranteed. It, it was just, it was really like, it was crushing. And for those who have managed to escape, their journey wasn't just terrifying, it was frustrating. Just listen to these evacuees describe their escape. You know, we were contacted on Monday, 10 days after the fighting uh, started. Uh, we had no communication. I mean, just the general emails letting us know that, you know, we're working on a plan. It's not safe right now to come and evacuate Canadians. We had to actually find our own way to the base. And I was lucky enough to live within close proximity, which is a half an hour drive. Uh, I am by myself, a female by myself, getting in a car, a rental car 
where there is fuel shortages and people getting robbed, people getting, you know, uh, nobody wanted to make that trek anywhere. It was abs like it was on an absolute need basis that you're roaming the streets. It's like um, generic emails that I was receiving um, until my cousins basically started calling the emergency line in Ottawa on my behalf. Um, we were actually giving the wrong information. Uh, we were told that we would be left in Jordan and we had to make our own accommodations and, and book our flights home from there. But that was a completely different story. We were picked up by the Germans, uh, taken to Germany, and uh, you know we're left to fend for ourselves pretty much. And many Sudanese Canadians here in Canada have been trying to fill the gaps in information, desperately working to get their families who are stuck in Sudan to safety. Like this McGill professor trying to get his mother out of the country. Like thousands of, uh, or actually tens of thousands of Sudanese, she had to flee the capital um, and take a bus uh, that across the desert for 18 hours, and a very treacherous road. She's finally arrived about two and a half hours from the Egyptian border. And we're trying very, uh, as much as we can, to try to find transportations and also try to get her through, through the border to safety. And when we think about how all of this is unfolding, there are aspects of it that remind us of Canada's evacuation efforts in Afghanistan when the Taliban took over the country in 2021. Canada came under heavy criticism for how it handled those evacuations. And experts say that what we're seeing play out in Sudan should be a lesson for the future. This is a region that is highly volatile and can be very unpredictable. And so anybody you put on the ground and any assets you put on the ground are inherently uh, inherently at risk. Uh, but it also shows, for instance, Canada does not have a foreign human intelligence collection service. So it means we don't have the intelligence on the ground that, for instance, our German, British, American, French allies have had. And we saw, for instance, how smooth the French evacuation went. And so, you know, what you invest is ultimately the return that you get uh, in these sort of moments where ultimately each country is going to look after its own nationals first. We'll keep an eye on this story as it continues to unfold and we'll be right back after this.